Hello, everybody. I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Jihan Kim is an associate pr professor at the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, where most recently he has been working on uh, simulation and artificial design of porous materials for environmental related applications. Um, many of you might remember Jihan from his time as a petascale postdoc at NERSC. So he's a familiar and friendly face for some of us. So um, thanks, Jihan, for coming and, um, and and take it away. Yeah, thank you for hosting me, Brian. Um, as mentioned, my name is Jihan Kim, and currently I'm an associate professor at KAIST, which is in Korea, and I'm in the chemical engineering department there. So, um, sorry, this is... Um, I don't know why I can't go back. Hold on. Sorry. Um, so I received my um, BS from UC Berkeley. I was in the EECS department and I got my MS and PhD from Urbana-Champaign. And as Brian mentioned, I was a part of the Petascale postdoc in NERSC from 2009 to 2011. And that was a great opportunity for me to work with the scientists at UC Berkeley. Uh, in particular, Professor Baron Smith and Professor Martin Head Gordon. And that's where we connected um, their scientific uh, knowledge to our um, uh, neuro supercomputing, um, I guess, facilities as well as our skills. And that's where I learned a lot from regarding computing as well as the, um, the chemistry and the science. And after the Petroscale postdoc, I stayed with Professor Baron Smith as a postdoc at UC Berkeley and Berkeley Lab. And after that, I got my position at KAIST. So um, I'm interested in a lot of different multi-scale methods when it comes to um, chemistry and materials. So in particular, we look into various quantum chemical methods, such as DFT, MP2, Monte Carlo, uh, MP2, and so forth. And then a lot of the classical uh, molecular simulation methods, such as uh, GCMC, molecular dynamics, and so forth. And in Korea also these days, um, AI and machine learning is very uh, trendy. So uh, we're looking a lot into various machine learning techniques, which I'll cover in this talk. And for the materials that we're modeling, we model many different materials, but for the most part, I focus on porous materials, such as zeolites and moss and so forth, but we do other 2D materials as well. And the applications include many of the environmental and energy related applications. So my research lab and research, um, I guess, career these days can be sort of divided into four different subcategories. First is um, where we look into applications of porous materials. And in this realm, what we do is we work closely with experimentalists and we concentrate on just modeling one specific material that has very interesting properties. So um, this is a type where we just sort of focus on one material and one material only. And the second type of material um, subproject is where we do next generation materials genome, where instead of doing one material, we do thousands or sometimes millions of materials. And we find ways to screen for the best properties. And we collaborate with experimentalists on sort of trying to synthesize the best materials that we covered from our screening procedure. So this is the type of stuff that I did with uh, Professor Baron Smith when I was um, at postdoc. And also with the third um, subproject, we do AI and machine learning. Um, and this will be sort of covered in detail in this, um, uh, this talk, where um, instead of doing sort of um, design by our sort of um, conventional methods, we use um, deep neural networks to design porous materials that have uh, user desired capabilities. And finally, we do software developments also, and we concentrate on sort of um, different aspects of um, creating materials, modeling materials, and so forth. So this is um, the picture we took, and currently I'm on a sabbatical and I'm in UC San Diego right now. Um, but this was a picture that we took, and this is my research lab just before I left. Um, so things were very sort of unique, as you all know, uh, during the COVID stages. Um, but luckily for computational researchers like me, the um, sort of the gap wasn't too noticeable because we can still do remote work and 
remote computing and that kind of stuff. And these are some of the um, uh, projects and companies that are uh, funding our lab currently. And um, so we're grateful for their um, contributions. So here's the outline of the talk. Briefly, I'll go over what porous materials are, and then I'll go over different um, stages of porous materials. Sorry, this I think this is sort of an auto um, sort of going through pages. So it seems like it's going on its own. So I'll try to control it, but it might be confusing. Um, so I'll introduce the porous materials first. So introduction to porous materials. So Nanoporous materials have pores on the order of few angstroms to nanometers, and different classes of these porous materials exist, such as zeolites, metal organic frameworks, covalent organic frameworks, and so forth. So the one commonality amongst these porous materials is, as the name suggests, they have these pores that are on, um, that can um, sort of capture different types of gas molecules, store them, and use them for different applications. And because they have these uh, millions of these small pores, they have very large surface area. And these pores can be highly tunable based on what kind of metals you use, what kind of functional groups you use, and a lot of sort of other um, engineering aspects where we can tune the pore, which can tune the applications of these materials. So some of the applications of nanoporous materials are sensors where you have these porous materials and these gas molecules can approach and adsorb onto these materials. And as it does, you can have a chemi-resistive response such that you can have uh, sensors for toxic gas molecules and so forth. And second is catalysis where you um, create different chemical compounds from your inputs. And these types of reactions typically happen inside the pore and these types of materials can facilitate these reactions such that you get the chemical products that you want. Gas separation is one big thing, including something like CO2 separation, where you have different uh, flux of gas molecules entering into these porous materials. And based on the pore geometry and size, you can selectively adsorb certain molecules while sort of hindering other molecules from entering in. So it can be a valuable filter for different uh, gas molecular systems. And finally, for storage, such as methane and hydrogen, where this large surface area allows a lot of gas adsorption, such that if you compare the case where you don't have the material, you can adsorb more gas molecules under similar external conditions. And as such, it can be a very good storage device. And from a sort of a data science perspective, even before um, um, all the sort of the machine learning and data science was a fad, the number of coarse materials, which extends in this graph up to 2010, has been increasing rapidly. So these are sort of thousands of structures, new structures that are synthesized. And this is just for one class of coarse materials called MOFs. So currently, the number of experimentally synthesized MOFs is over 100,000. And then there's millions of hypothetical MOFs, hypothetical force materials that people have been sort of um, uh, creating in silico inside the computer. So you know, even before the data science thing sort of took off in its sort of um, brand, there were a lot of data, at least in terms of material science with regards to these force materials. So one research goal in our group is to sort of create new porous materials in silico such that we can facilitate the materials development, relay this information to the experimentalist, and then hopefully we can synthesize useful materials fast. So what we did was we sort of looked into um, different classes of coarse materials, and we wanted to sort of concentrate on groups of materials that have yet to be synthesized. So this diagram is, might be a little bit outdated. We created when it was like 2015, 2016, and we concentrated on sort of different types of porous materials that we can create in silico. And some of these things like mothic cough, zeolite at cough were not common. And we're trying to think of why they were not common and seeing whether or not we can create these new porous materials inside a computer. So um, just sort of taking a look at current stages in porous materials, but I guess this can be generalized to materials in general. 
I think there are two sort of main different ways in which we can create new materials. And I adopt this sort of a natural or human design and an artificial design. And a natural design is where sort of this process comes from um, sort of um, the researchers at the field where we think about how to develop new materials. And then we sort of take that thoughts and take these ideas and map it onto a certain algorithm that the computer can understand. And then we try to sort of create new materials and have them synthesized. So um, this is sort of the process that uh, procedure that um, most of us have been doing for the last decades or so. But now there's a parallel approach where instead of sort of thinking about how to design new algorithm for new materials, we just give it a lot of data because there's a lot of data of um, both experimental and hypothetical materials, and then see if the neural network can uh, create new materials. So I think this is sort of a parallel path. I would argue that at this point, um, in terms of at least theoretical or computational development of materials, the one above is still can sort of um, uh, create sort of new novel materials is better at that. Um, whereas the one sort of below is better at creating materials that are sort of similar to whatever is out there. And that goes with sort of um, um, this notion that with machine learning and deep learning, it's easier to interpolate and in, it's easier to create something that looks like a lot of the previous big data, um, as opposed to creating something that's just sort of totally um, new and out there. So I guess in that sense, um, the old techniques better, but perhaps in um, 10 years or so, it might be different. So before going into artificial design, I'll just sort of introduce um, sort of um, uh, one natural design approach and one case study from our group, okay, to contrast with the artificial design. And this is what we dubbed as the nano uh, porous materials mashup project. And for those of you who are familiar with the word mashup, it's um, used in music when it comes to production, where you have two different songs or two different music or two or more, and you integrate them or sort of overlap them on top of one another, and then sort of do some editing and play it sort of simultaneously, such that the newly recorded music sounds very sort of unique and new. And similarly, what we did was we have a sort of a large pool of experimentally synthesized porous materials. For example, material A here, which is MOF5, material B here, which is some other MOF. And we tried to overlap them on top of one another. And usually this leads to a lot of um, collisions between the atoms. So you don't get something that's thermodynamically stable. But if we have millions of materials and we do all these sort of pairwise pairings, then accidentally you might stumble onto a pair of materials that can sort of fit in very well, such that it would be thermodynamically stable. And we're thinking, we, so the algorithm was to sort of identify these mashed up materials and to see whether we can synthesize them. So um, we devised a simple computational algorithm to sort of identify these materials that are what's called hetero interpenetration, where they are sort of, um, uh, kind of inter, inter, so their distance is very close to one another, but they have enough room such that they're thermodynamically stable. And we work with experimentalists on how to synthesize these materials. And we thought that these new class of materials can be very useful for many different applications. So we started with over 80,000 materials and we used our mashup algorithm to sort of pairwise connect all these materials and see which one of these can uh, hetero interpenetrate. And the sort of the sample image of hetero interpenetrated unicell looks something like this, where blue is one material and red is the second material. And we provided like a couple of these hetero interpenetrated materials to experimental um, um, uh, group. And unfortunately they couldn't synthesize them. This is a very sort of cumbersome process and we can go into reasons why they couldn't do it, but um, uh, it's very difficult. So instead of we, we sort of um, looked into other types of materials. We're thinking that with some tweaking, we can go into these hetero interpenetrated pores moth and then just sort of move on to core shell. And core shell, the algorithm's kind of similar in the sense that the two materials need to have similar lattice constants such that they can sort of match well. 
And then you can have, you, you need to have sort of a good sort of connecting points between material A and material B such that they can chemically bond. The good thing about these core shell materials is that you don't have to worry about sort of this comfort on uh, this sort of task of having diffusion of the second moth into the first moth, which was very difficult in the experimental synthesis. Because here you can do a sequential reaction where you just sort of synthesize the core moth, and then after that, just synthesize the shell moth on the top. So it's easier. So that's what we did. What we did was with these sort of 80,000 or moths, we sort of um, did a sort of a manual fingerprint on where the chemical connection points would be. So we took a unit cell of first moth, we cut them in a plane, identify these atoms where the second moth would connect. For example, this is a carboxylate linker with the oxygen. And so this is where the oxygen atoms will be located. So you match this fingerprint with some second moth, third moth, and see which ones can sort of overlap on top of one another such that uh, one metal can connect to the other oxygen or, uh, and vice versa. So this is a sample moth where we have one moth, moth five, the ligand oxygen is located here. The second moth called H cus one, the metal atoms are located here. So if you overlap this unit cell on top of one another, they would fit nicely such that they're on top of one another. And if you look at that from another view, they're sort of clicking like sort of like a, a magnets clicking on sort of um, the other part of the magnet and just fitting perfectly. So inside the computer, we can see that these two moths would in principle connect very well. So we tried synthesizing some of these pairs. This is what they look like inside the computer with blue being the first moth and the yellow being the second moth. And then we see that we get these really nice looking uh, experimentally uh, core shell moth. Or you have the, for example, here, you have the core as this blue area and the shell with white. And these are sort of uh, very nicely clean looking materials. And we were the first group to sort of um, predict a lot of these metal organic composites inside the computer and successfully have them synthesized. So all um, some of this during the uh, research process, they worked so well that we thought that maybe everything will work well, but that wasn't what was reported. So what we did was we purposefully took two materials that have bad connection points. So you see that when we sort of overlap these two moths on top of one another, they don't match well. And then we tried experimentally synthesizing them and they look messy. So um, it wasn't the case that we get these nice clean structures all the time. We need to judiciously choose the two sort of core and the shell moths that would connect with one another very well. So that was um, sort, of, um, uh, sort of very nice. And we sort of um, moved on to this type of work where instead of doing 3D, 3D moth, 3D moth connection, we do 3D moth and 2D moth connection, sort of like this. And these 2D moths are sensor moths. So right now we have some of these materials that we sort of predict inside our computer and they can be used as part of the chemi-resistive sensor. So we work with these uh, people who are sort of um, creating these modules such that the materials that we des design is inside the sensor interface. This whole thing, the smart card sensor module goes inside your cell phone such that if it detects certain gases like NO2 or CO or something, then it will give a signal. So we're working on this with collaboration with Samsung right now. And it's pretty exciting how sort of we can build these materials inside a computer and have them sort of um, be ported inside these sort of um, electronic devices. So that's very interesting. So that was an example of natural design where we came up with an algorithm to connect two materials. But um, we want to sort of, in, we're kind of, I guess we're all kind of lazy in certain sense. So we want to, to let the machine do all the work in creating new materials because it's hard to sort of come up with um, good design. So we've been looking into this artificial design of porous materials for a while. And we'll sort of go into sort of three different subcategories here. So first was zeolites. But before doing that, we um, I think from the AlphaGo on where um, there was a machine learning craze, the natural sort of extension amongst the uh, people who are doing materials development and in silico materials design was whether or not the neural network can design new materials. And the sort of the workflow for all of this is simple in the sense that you just give it a lot of materials data and somehow this will learn 
what these materials look like and then come up with new materials. And that's how we uh, people do it with something like pictures and all sort of other data where you have a lot of sort of these input images and then it can create new images. Uh, but this is sort of easy, this wasn't that sort of easy for a lot of these materials initially. And we had a lot of problems with that. Um, and it wasn't due to lack of data in my opinion, because there's millions of these materials available. So that was, I think, sufficient enough. But the problem was that we um, sort of um, try to sort of uh, create new materials using AI, using sort of an approach that might not be that suitable initially, but we tried anyway. Um, and I'll sort of go into this detail first. So we looked into what kind of course materials that we want AI to sort of create. And there are a bunch of different candidates, but um, we wanted to focus on crystalline porous materials. And we wanted to sort of focus on something easy first. And the easiest sort of class is uh, zeolites and, the and especially the pure silica zeolites. The one reason why it's easy is that chemically it's very simple compared to other sort of complex porous materials in that you have only two atom types, silicon and oxygen. So all you have to do is sort of um, concentrate on these two atom types. And the, the way that this sort of um, tetrahedral SiO4 structure is bonded to one another, that will, the topology sort of dictates how many different zeolites there would be. So essentially chemically, these pure silica zeolites are all the same. It's just that how they're linked together in topology is what sort of creates a wide variety of them. So there's, computationally discovered zeolites is very large. So we, um, um, this was something that's available to us. So we use this zeolite as a training set for our neural network. And we wanted to not just create zeolites, but we wanted to create zeolites that has certain user desired uh, properties. So we focused on methane assortion as this is sort of one of the easiest ones to model. And this has its application value because um, with regards to energy storage, because um, this is somewhat outdated, but USDOE, they were interested in the um, methane storage technology for these vehicles um, because the CNG vehicles that run on natural gas, um, they have to be stored in very um, sort of high pressure at around, uh, I think 700 bar or so. And that uh, we wanted to sort of make this uh, pressure mild conditions. So we wanted to store them at room temperature at sort of a uh, mild pressure. And in order to do so, the CNG gas tank, it doesn't contain any materials, but we wanted to sort of put materials inside to sort of absorb high amount of CO2 or methane. So we wanted to create porous materials or we wanted AI to create porous materials that have these capacities. And we use something called GON, Generative Adversarial Network. And I think it was developed in 2014. It largely has two neural networks, the discriminator and the generator. And uh, I think the analogy or the uh, case study that a lot of people use is for the sort of um, fake versus real money. And the idea is that the police want to catch the thief that's making this uh, fake money and the uh, thief want to sort of create more realistic money. So if you have sort of a neural network that competes with one another through effort serial learning, after a while, the thief will be very good at sort of making fake money that looks just like realistic money, okay? So that's sort of the model that we look for um, this creation is that we wanted to sort of um, give a lot of these sort of real zeolites to our neural network, and then they would create something. Um, but initially it wouldn't look that great. So discrimination would be very high in the sort of fake. And then, so that neural network would have to sort of uh, get better at creating more realistic material. And then you'll see that how that might lead to better zeolites, okay? So um, the objective of this project was sort of twofold. We wanted to sort of um, just create new zeolites because back in four, four or five years ago, there wasn't anyone who managed to create uh, these porous materials using AI. So we wanted to be the first group to do it. And the second is not just creating just any old zeolites, but we wanted the zeolites to have certain user desired capacity or properties such that for methane storage, you wanted the user to say, I want this material that have um, certain range of methane heat of absorption. And then the zeolite would sort of give you that range. So we wanted that user desired capability because that's sort of the, 
hallmark of this sort of um, using neural network is the inverse design where you give this property that you want the material to have and the neural network could create that kind of uh, material. So one of the problems that we ran into was that um, there were sort of works done on creating small molecules using AI, but um, with these complex periodic structure that weren't any sort of work. Um, and for example, input representation is such a critical sort of feature and something like the um, MNIST problem that's commonly used in machine learning, you have these sort of numbered images and one of the natural way to sort of represent this is biomatrix where you sort of, um, the whites are zeros and the blacks are one and so forth. But um, we weren't really sure how to represent the zeolites. And we need to take into account the lattice parameter size, which you don't have to do in small molecules because the notion of lattice parameters and periodicity doesn't exist in small molecules. And then we need to sort of abide by the periodic boundary condition. And this is something that the neural network just doesn't know. So you need to sort of enforce this criterion somehow and so forth. So initially we had a lot of difficulties. And what we decided to do was we decided to use the 3D shape representation where we would sort of um, just take the unit cell of zeolites. These are crystalline materials. So these small unit cells, they sort of um, expand and uh, repeat themselves across the X, Y, Z dimensions. And, we, and the idea is with the zeo, uh, neural network can create the unit cell, then we can just use that for expansion, okay? Um, so what we did was we tried to sort of create these shapes as um, sort of 3D pictures and the position of these atoms, for example, the oxygen, um, we use a Gaussian distribution um, where these sort of reds are sort of located at the center of the atoms and similar to uh, silicon where the yellow was uh, located at the position of the silicon. And for the methane assertion, this methane property Sorry about the, um, the uh, uh, laser point. Um, the property shape was um, represented as green. So essentially we have these colored images. So we can represent all of these sort of zeolites in that kind of manner where the red, yellow represent the silicon and the oxygen and the green represents the methane assortion sort of locations where the methane likes to be. So a sample zeolite can be represented as follows. And we have the generator creating these sort of um, zeolite type of a picture. And then we have the uh, critic um, sort of differentiating between the real and the uh, fake zeolites. So this is sort of a sample run. Initially, the um, generator, it creates something that just looks like noise. And as sort of the, um, this EMD is the earth mover distance, which is the distance between real and generated data distributions. So we sort of have a metric to separate between the real sort of distributions of the uh, zeolite and the fake distribution. And then after a while, as the number of steps sort of increase, you see that after a while, it sort of starts looking like a realistic zeolite. So this is the um, generated zeolites. And this x-axis is silicon to O oxygen ratio. In all of these, um, uh, zeolites, the silicon to oxygen ratio should be 0.5. So it's peaked here, but you see that it's creating a lot of these zeolites or pseudo zeolites that are not abiding by this SI to O ratio. And if you look at some sample pictures, you see that the AI is creating something that looks nothing like zeolites. And then sort of in this 0.5 area, it's look, creating something that looks like it. And then at higher ratio, again, nothing like the zeolites. So um, we generated 1 million zeolites using the AI. And unfortunately, only around 120 20 of them were real zeolites. And the other is sort of all bad, poorly created materials. So there needs to be a lot of work done still. And these are sort of sample zeolites or sample materials that were successful zeolites. So you see that the red and the yellow are the position of the silicon oxygen created by the um, uh, the AI, and you have zeolite one, zeolite two, zeolite three, and so forth. And these are the shapes. Um, so I'll, I'll try to answer the question later, okay? Um, so once we, um, once the neural networks sort of create these, 
then um, we do some post-processing where we need to identify the center of the um, position of these atoms. We need to uh, connect the bonds and then we do need to do ge ge geometrical optimization. So once we did that, um, these were the cleaned up zeolites and we compare them to sort of a uh, wider database of zeolites where um, those weren't sort of seen by the neural network. And they saw, we saw that they created new sort of materials that were outside of the, either the training or the test sets. And we noticed something kind of weird is that um, it created something that looks like this also, sorry. Um, and this is sort of a fake zeolite. This isn't really a zeolite, but it created something like this and it matched something on the hypothetical zeolite database. So it turns out that um, even in the hypothetical zeolite database that people created in the past, there's something that warned zeolites, but they were sort of mistakenly added there. And the neural network sort of saw this and it created something similar. So we, uh, it's interesting how you can sort of identify these sort of um, error, erroneous structures in the wider database this way. And then we also created zeolites that were not part of any of the database, but were sort of um, can be defined as zeolites. So we're excited about this work because this sort of was a first sort of successful attempt at creating these sort of complicated crystalline coarse materials using AI. But we wanted to go one step further and we wanted to do inverse design and sort of create zeolites that have certain properties. So what we did was, if you recall from our unicell shape, um, there's the red and the yellow, which um, were the position of the um, silicon and the oxygen atoms. And the green are the, the methane assortion map where um, the uh, methane likes to be. So using this sort of green map, we can quickly compute the heat of assortion. And because we can compute the heat of assortion, we can use a penalty function such that if the user desired zeolite has a heat of assortion within a certain range, then we bias the creation just within that range and give high penalties for anything that's outside of it. So once we did that, these are the profiles of the zeolites created before this penalty function and after the penalty function. So before the penalty function, you see that the purple distribution is very wide. Whereas after implementation of this loss function is peaked at around 18 to 22 kilojoules. So it's taking this sort of in the creation mode and then it's just sort of creating the zeolites that have just this sort of narrow range. So we, identify, uh, we looked into some of these structures and eight, I think around 80% of the materials with this user defined sort of criterion had this heat of assortion within that range. So this demonstrated that we can not only just create zeolites, but we can create user desired zeolites as well. So this is something that we worked on for zeolites. And then we moved on to um, MOFs, which are chemically more complicated, but um, they're in some sense, they're modular and they have high tunability, okay? Compared to zeolites, they're both crystalline, both porous, but they're co chemically complicated. So for MOFs, we decided that we're not gonna use the Gaussian representation to represent the position of each of the atoms. That'll be too cumbersome. And that's sort of a, sort of, we, we, we're sort of, we found this to be so difficult that we thought that it would be sort of good to use the modular nature of these materials. In the sense that these MOFs, can be um, decomposed into metal clusters and organic linkers that are stitched together. So instead of representing all these sort of metal cluster atoms one by one, we can just sort of lump them all together and just sort of represent this as some type A and this linker as some type B, okay? And that would be sort of a much sort of better representation for MOFs such that if we have sort of a um, uh, MOF that whose unicell looks like this, um, we can just sort of abstract them into a metal complex that looks like this and a linker, like a stick that looks like this. And these can be a Lego building block with certain topology so that once we identify the metal node, the edge and the topology, then we can uniquely identify what the material looks like. And then we can use that type of a representation as for the machine learning to create new materials. So they wouldn't be creating these metal clusters, these linkers from scratch, They'll just be using them and then sort of stitching them in a different manner to sort of um, build a wider range of these MOF structures. And we sort of um, accumulated about 3000 topologies from a database such that um, 
we have a wide range of metal nodes, uh, organic linkers, and these mathematical topologies. And sort of the um, schematics to create new MOFs is something like this. Initially, we generate a bunch of hypothetical MOFs, and then we uh, compute a property that we want for MC simulation. So we did this for methane, we did this for hydrogen, we did this for xenon krypton separation, but I'll just concentrate on methane for now. So once you have this, um, you want to sort of go over a very large space of MOFs to create the materials that have very good methane storage um, capacities. And to sort of um, uh, compute the methane storage capacities, we need to do grand canonical Monte Carlo simulations. And they might take minutes or so, but within this framework of keep on generating new materials, doing a Monte Carlo simulation, and then sort of going back and forth, even that small sort of wall time of uh, 15 to 20 minutes was long. So what we wanted to do was instead of doing Monte Carlo simulation, we wanted to create a neural network code that can just output a methane working capacity if when the input is the topology, the metal node, and the organic linker. So uh, we wanted to replace the grand canonical Monte Carlo simulation with the neural network such that within this sort of workflow, everything happens much quicker. And finally, um, what we wanted to do was we wanted to identify sort of the best combination of these um, topology, metal nodes, and linkers that yield the highest working capacity. So we, had a, we added a genetic algorithm flow to it such that during the genetic algorithm stages, you sort of swap a lot of these uh, uh, metal nodes, linkers with one another, and then use this sort of neural network to uh, compute the methane working capacity. And the idea is that the ones that are sort of high gets passed on to the next generation. And then you sort of keep on doing this sort of iterative thing. So with the input, we have the topology, the node, and the edge. We had about 17,000 or a uh, little bit less than 2,000 topologies, uh, about 700 metal nodes, and 200 organic linkers. And they can all be stitched together. So if you do all these combinations, um, and if you can allow for multiple metal nodes and multiple edges such that you can have two different kinds of metal nodes and two different kinds of linkers within a single material, which is commonly found in these materials, then I think the combination was very large, 10 to the 14 or something. So with the brute force screening for methane storage, the idea that you go through all these 200 trillion um, hypothetical MOF structures was very cumbersome. So we wanted to sort of use a genetic algorithm for this. Um, so um, to access or assess, evaluate uh, methane storage, we use um, Monte Carlo simulation and we use a GPU Monte Carlo simulation tool. The model and the parameter we used for it was the classical Leonard Jones potential, universal for force field for MOF, trap B for methane. And the target met, um, property is methane working capacity which is for uptake at 65 bar, uptake at 5.8 bar. And that is the condition for the methane storage for these uh, ANG vehicles. And the temperature is room temperature at 298K. And the, sort of the one component was to build a neural network that can um, um, predict the methane working capacity such that when it's part of the genetic algorithm and part of the component, even minutes, is very long time. So we wanted this to sort of output in seconds. So we trained um, the um, about, I think, 50,000 MOFs computed um, G, uh, GCMC simulations with the working capacity. So that's the working capacity on the x-axis. And our prediction of the machine learning model is the y-axis. So you see that it's relatively well. It predicts sort of at the y equals x. So with this tool, then we can use that to just um, output um, what the methane working capacity would be for an uh, input MOF. So then um, what happens within this component is that we have these topologies, nodes, and edges, and we have these MOF embeddings. I think they're represented just basically as integers. Node is um, based on the node type, one, two, three, four. Edge based on the input type, one, two, three, four. So with the topology. And um, it predicts the methane working capacity, and we use that in conjunction with the genetic algorithm. What the genetic algorithm would do is swap a lot of these nodes with edges to find sort of new MOFs and sort of build them. And then we use this um, MOF machine learning model to predict the property. And then we're selecting the top percent that goes on to the next generation. And then we sort of continue this process 
to um, sort of judiciously explore, explore this 200 trillion moth um, sort of search space. So this is what happens with the genetic algorithm period. Random, this is working capacity. This is distribution of all the moths. You see that as we do the genetic algorithm, um, the distribution shifts to the right as we're getting sort of better and better, higher working capacity materials. And if you look at, I think these are the top 0.1% within each sort of period, you see that it's increasing. So we looked into sort of at the, when it sort of converged and the working capacity stopped increasing, we looked at the materials that we generated and this dashed line is the um, world record. And we managed to create about nine, a little bit less than thousand moths that surpassed the world record using this uh, sort of um, uh, fuse machine learning and a genetic algorithm mo model. And these are some of the materials sort of that are top candidates. So we're trying to work with experimentalists to synthesize some of these materials. So the final sort of um, phase is the synthesis part, okay? So um, a lot of times with porous materials, the biggest stumbling block when we work with experimentalists is that we have this very beautiful and nice structure that theoretically should be sort of uh, thermodynamically stable, everything's fine, but we can't synthesize them or the experimentalists. There's many different reasons. They say um, <clears throat> something like they're not getting uh, crystalline materials. There's um, these ligands are difficult to sort of um, synthesize and they're getting different topologies and so forth. So this is sort of a common stumbling block these days amongst all sort of computational materials research where you get to the end in identifying the materials that have great properties, but we can't synthesize them. So, and conventionally there aren't too many or sort of conventional molecular simulation techniques that model synthesis. It's complicated using various sort of, um, uh, various sort of, um, sort of these precursors and um, all, all that stuff with different temperature. And there's a lot of complicated dynamics going on so that it's very difficult to model sort of synthesis. So <clears throat> instead of using these sort of um, conventional molecular simulation techniques to model synthesis, we were thinking about using machine learning to do it. Okay. So the general idea is this, um, mentioned earlier that there are a lot of MOFs that have been synthesized. So for every synthesis, successful synthesis, there's a sort of a corresponding paper. So that if we jot through the paper, there's a synthesis section. <clears throat> and it talks about the MOF name, what kind of metal precursors are used, what kind of organic precursors are used, what solvents, sorry, what's the time and what's the temperature and there are other information, okay? So we're kind of thinking that if we can um, collect this information, that would be the um, sort of the successful synthesis condition for a particular month. So perhaps if we have enough of this data, then the machine learning can sort of learn and output what kind of synthesis conditions are required for a new month, okay? So the first part of this was the text mining. And this is very dirty work in a certain sense. And um, I think few people are sort of starting to do text mining. Um, um, and the workflow goes something like this. We download a lot of papers with the permission from these sort of um, journals and publishers. And then um, based on the format, we sort of um, try to identify the synthesis paragraph. And for MOF papers, um, it's very nice because these synthesis paragraphs are all sort of in one section in the manuscript. So it's not too difficult to identify them. And then we wanted to get information on the MOF name, precursor, solvent, and so forth. And then sort of use that for the next step. So we um, accumulated over 28,000 papers and we went to um, sort of, we eliminated them to sort of 13,000 papers based on whether or not we can sort of um, use them and whether they have these synthesis information. And then uh, we had a test set. We uh, developed a text mining code to get all this information regarding the metal precursor, organic precursor conditions, and so forth. And we checked the F1 score on a test set of 100 moths, and they're pretty well. Point in this text mining materials world, I think 0 0.7, 0 0.8 is pretty decent performance. We can't get all of them, um, unfortunately. So um, we got this information. 
And then we looked into statistics on what kind of metal precursors are often used, what kind of organic precursors are used, what kind of solvents are used for um, these all these sort of structures. And we checked with the experimentalists on the sanity of this text mined data, and they were sufficient enough such that we can use this to um, feed the machine learning algorithm. And with the machine learning algorithm with regards to synthesis, there's always this sort of issue where um, only the successful synthesis is reported and the unsuccessful synthesis is not reported. So we have sort of mismatch in the data in that we only have positive data and we don't have any sort of negative data. And it turns out that when the data set is skewed like this, people use something called the PU learning, where you identify these sort of successful cases as positive, and um, we create a bunch of sort of hypothetical cases to be uh, unlabeled. So uh, in this case, the input is the metal precursor type, organic precursor type, composition, temperature, time, and solvents. So we have this information for the positive data. For the in silico data, we just sort of randomly choose a combinations of metals, composition, temperature, and so forth. So that's our unlabeled data. And the idea is that the PU learning algorithm can distinguish between the positive and the unlabeled such that um, it can give a crystalline score, which is sort of equivalent to whether or not it can be synthesized or not. And we saw that with the positive data, which is green, um, it gives high scores. And because we didn't have negative data, what we did was instead of using um, negative data, we had something called the amorphous data in the sense that certain uh, number of these MOFs were reported as being amorphous in the literature. So we're thinking that these are sort of akin to not being successful. So we uh, took this amorphous data synthesis conditions for selected MOFs, and we saw that the PU algorithm, um, it, it sort of reports a very low negative score in the red for these MOFs. So we're thinking that this is sort of one way where we can distinguish between this type of a model can be used to sort of input a particular synthesis condition and it can give a crystalline score based on whether or not it's high or low. And the ones are low, I guess that can be sort of fed into our screening procedure such that we sort of say that these are difficult to synthesize. So, so um, we sort of um, negate them. Or we can sort of search through a different sort of synthesis condition parameters and try to find the best optimal synthesis condition for a given MOF based on this model. So um, these are some of the work that's being done in our lab. We're doing natural, sort of, sorry, natural sort of design, which is cumbersome, but kind of fun. Um, and then we're doing a lot of artificial design where we look into different input representations with user desired properties. And finally, we're doing a lot of text mining and um, sort of, I forgot to include it here, but we do a lot of image mining and figure mining also from these texts. Students, they don't like doing these types of text and image mining because they think it's a lot of work, but um, it, uh, it might not yield a lot of things, but um, I think it's impor important. So we try to sort of, we're trying to gain as much information from the previously published papers to see whether or not we can use them to uh, get synthesis conditions. And ultimately sort of in four or five years, what we want to do is we want to use these sort of text and image data to, um, uh, write new papers and to sort of write new projects and to combine different concepts such that even the um, research idea generation and the paper writing process can be automated using AI, hopefully. So thank you for your time.